Hi, in this video we're going to do an introduction to web scraping. So, um, what do we mean by scraping the web? What and why? There is increasing amount of data available on the web and these data are usually provided in an unstructured format and you can always copy and paste these data, but this can be quite time consuming, especially if you have to do it across multiple pages and it can also be prone to errors. And so web scraping is the process of extracting this information automatically and transforming it into a structured data set. There are two different scenarios and we're going to focus on the first, but I want to say a few things about the second as well. The first scenario is screen scraping. So we're extracting data from the source code of the website with an HTML parser. That's what we're going to use or regular expression matching, which basically means that we're looking at these text strings that are in the source code of the data and we're actually manually extracting pieces of it that contain the data that we need from it. Um, doing this sort of regular expression matching is a little less easy, but we are going to touch on it a little bit throughout the week, although much, much of the work that we're going to do in terms of scraping the web is going to use an HTML parser, specifically an R package that does this for you. Um, web APIs, API standing for Application Programming Interface, um, is when a website offers a set of structured HTTP requests that return to us uh, files in the format of generally JSON or XML. So in this case, you're not necessarily looking at the source code of the data, but you can actually make these requests to the website, which will then make the data available to you. Let me give you this example. Suppose that we want to scrape some data from a static web page. That's not going to change at whatever hour you're going to go to it. Um, you can basically write some code using an HTML parser, using an R package that will help you do that and get the data out of there. For example, think about a Wikipedia page, right? It changes a little bit from time to time, but generally the text there is static. Versus, think about getting data out of Twitter. Your timeline is constantly changing. And so if you actually want to get data from a particular person's timeline or at a particular time, uh, instead of trying to scrape the screen that you're seeing with your human eyes, what you might want to do is make requests through the Twitter API to their database saying, I want data or I want tweets from this particular person at this particular time. So Twitter and many other websites like this make this sort of information available. And you can imagine that many of the apps you use that use data from a other websites use these APIs to get the data. Um, for the purposes of this class, we're going to focus more on screen sp scraping, but when appropriate, we're going to make a few comments about where web APIs might be useful for us as well. Um, so we're going to be doing our web scraping, as I said, with an R package called Arvest. But before we get into what Arvest is, I want to say a little bit about what a web page looks like. If you have ever made a web page, even a very, very simple one, um, you, you are probably familiar with the uh, letters HTML. So this is hypertext markup language. Most of the data on the web is largely available at, in HTML format. And this is usually what an HTML page looks like. You can see that it starts with a tag called HTML and then it ends with HTML as well. And when I say ends, I mean there's like a, a forward slash there seeing HTML started and HTML ended. And within that, there are two parts to it. There's a head, which is usually like a title of your web page, and then a body, which is the rest of the content. So over here, what we have in the body tags is a paragraph, that's what the P is about, where the text is aligned in the center and the text we're presenting on the web page just says hello world with an exclamation point at the end. So that's the text portion of it. This is what the website uh, source looks like. Now, if we wanted to use this in R as a data frame, we wouldn't want our uh, data to look like this. We would need it to be look uh, to look rectangular. Maybe you would have a column for head and a column for body, and then um, you have the two uh, the text that are associated with the two things in the um, in the appropriate columns. So this structured. Um, look that we're seeing here for the HTML code. It is structured, but it's hierarchical or kind of tree based, but it's often not available in a form that's useful for analysis. And for that, we usually want flat data that's tidy. So in rectangular format where rows are observations and columns are variables. 
Enter Arvis. So Arvis is a package that is that makes basic processing and manipulation of HTML data quite straightforward. So you yourself, one, don't have to understand very well how the HTML source code works. You want to have an idea of it just enough to be able to extract things out of it. And most importantly, uh, getting uh, used to the idea that Pieces of data on a website are stored under certain tags, and if I can give Arvest functions the appropriate tags, they will extract it for me. But you yourself don't need to be able to write the website code in order to be able to retrieve the data out of it. So Arvest makes this sort of process um, easy and straightforward, and it's designed to work with pipelines uh, built with the uh, pipe operator. So it's very tidyverse friendly. So we can think about doing things in a sequential manner, like go to the web page, grab this, and then do this, and then do that. Um, and we chain these together with the pipes as we usually do. Um, here are a few of the Arvest functions. Um, once again, I'm presenting these all to you just so you can get a sense of what these functions look like. Read HTML is what we're often going to start with, and it ju looks just like read CSV, read RDS, read Excel that we've seen. So that's usually the first part of reading the data in. In this case, your data is not in rectangular format. The rest of the Arvest functions are going to allow you to take the website source code and turn it into a rectangular format. So all read HTML does is it grabs the source code of the website and stores it as an object in R that's accessible by the other Arvest functions. So it reads HTML data from a URL or a character string. Usually we're going to be reading them in from a URL. So we're going to point it to the website where we want to read the data from. The rest of the functions, HTML node selects a specified node from an HTML document. No, HTML nodes select specified nodes, so multiples of them. HTML table is for grabbing a table as a whole. HTML text is for extracting out the text from any node that you have grabbed. Um, HTML name extracts the tags names. HTML ATTR and ATTRS basically extract um, each of the tags attributes or the value of those by name. Now, I've read these function names to you, and there is a good chance not many of them made sense just yet. But the thing I would like you to keep in mind is that all of these functions start with HTML underscore, and then some of the functions are just the plural of the other one, like node versus node. So if you want to read one thing, you would be using node versus if you want to read many things from a website, you would be using nodes. Uh, maybe HTML table is the most straightforward, maybe followed by HTML text saying, give me the text, not everything else around it. Um, but the rest of them we're going to learn more about as we put these functions into use. Um, another helper for us is going to be a tool called selector gadget. So I've used the word tags so far. I said that you don't necessarily need to be uh, able to write HTML code yourself or make websites, but you need to be okay with the idea that um, data on, the, on a website is stored within HTML code and you can identify certain pieces of the data that you need uh, using tags. So how do you figure out what these tags are? Um, you could read through the source code, which would be very tedious, or we can actually use a tool called Selector Gadget. It's an open source tool that eases CSS selector generation. So CSS is cascading style sheets, which is what is used to style a web page. And so what you do, for example, in your style sheet, you say things like my titles, I want them to be bolded and maybe color red. Uh, my regular text, I want it to be italic and maybe color orange. So these stylistic things are going to go into your um, style sheet. And uh, what the selector gadget does is it makes it easy to uh, grab certain pieces of data that is stored under the same um, selector same CSS selector on a web page. It is easiest to use with the Chrome extension, so I would recommend as you go through the exercises for this week to use a Chrome browser if you can. Um, and you can read more about it. There's a vignette to it that's linked from the slides, and I would recommend reading through it. It actually walks you through an example um, that is similar to what we're going to be seeing in our course. Um, 
So it reads some data from um, IMDB, and we're going to give a similar example, except we're going to be reading slightly different data from IMDB. So if you would like a second example to go through, that vignette is quite helpful. And as I said, if you are able to use a Chrome browser, you can install the extension, and then you'll be able to follow along with the steps that I am uh, showing you uh, as you go. So how do we use the selector gadget? So I'm at a web page. So this is the IMDb's uh, top 250 movies web page. It doesn't change a whole lot from year to year. Maybe this uh, ratings change just by a little bit. But as far as I can remember back, uh, the Shawshank Redemption has been on top of that list, for example, followed by The Godfather. So you can see that after I've installed the selector gadget, and I'll walk you through this step by step in a little bit as well. But what I'm doing is I'm clicking on certain things that I want. For example, do I want just the movie names or do I not want the movie names? So I click on it again. And what I want you to pay attention to is the fact that at the bottom of the web page, there's this. Um, a bar and the tags that are shown in there are changing. Now those tags may not necessarily be meaningful to you just yet, but the important th thing to keep in mind so far is that as you click on different pieces of the web page, those tags change. Once you install the selector gadget extension on Chrome, you should be able to see right next to your search bar an icon for the app, which it looks kind of like a plug. Um, so click on the app logo next to the uh, search bar in your browser. And once you do, you're going to see this um, box will open in the bottom right uh, corner of your browser. Uh, so far, it says no valid path found because um, you have not selected anything just yet. Then what you wanna do is you click on a page element. So in this case, I want the names of the movie. So I clicked on the name of the first movie and it will turn green. So we can see that Shawshank Redemption has turned green here. And then what Selector Gadget also does is that it generates a minimal CSS selector for that element. So you can see in that box in the bottom of the screen that it says title column or dot title column. And then next to it, uh, in the button, you can click on the clear button to clear that, but otherwise it says in parentheses uh, 250. So that means 250 things were selected. So once you click on a page element that turns green and Selector Gadget generates a minimal CSS selector for that element, it will also highlight everything that is matched by the selector in yellow. So those are the other things you're seeing in yellow. Then if you click on a highlighted element to remove it from the selector and the selection will turn red. So right now we only have the Shawshank Redemption selected because all the other yellow ones that were highlighted, we've now undone that by clicking on one of them. And you can see that the tag has changed. And even though the kind of the gibberish of letters uh, in that box may not be very meaningful, we can still see the dot title column. And then we see something that says child and then in parentheses one, that's basically saying the first element of something is selected. If we then click on an unhighlighted element, we can add it to the selector. So now what we've done is we're saying we're not just selecting the Shawshank Redemption, but we're selecting all the other movies as well. So we have a total of 249 selected. We can see in that box where it says clear. Um, the only one that is not selected so far is the Godfather. All right, so in general, what uh, using the CSS selector looks like is this process. So through this process of selection and rejection, Selector Gadget helps you come up with the appropriate CSS selector for your needs. You shouldn't expect to get it right in the first try. You should expect to click around a little bit, um, but you will get to it. And it also shouldn't be an extremely time consuming process. If it is, it might be worthwhile to actually take a look at the website source code. And we'll say a few more words about what that looks like in our next video.